All right, good morning to everyone and welcome to The Well here at STSA. Thank you for joining us here in Leesburg. Thank you for joining us across the camera there in Arlington. We are in part two of a series called Stories Jesus Told, The Kingdom Parables, where as the name implied, what we're doing is going through the parables that Jesus told that teach us about the kingdom of God. Now, when it comes to the kingdom of God, obviously, as soon as I say we're going to talk about the kingdom of God, we're going to say the kingdom of heaven, this is a subject which sparks a lot of interest. Because obviously, when you talk about kingdom of heaven, the stakes are much higher than when you talk about anything else, because we're talking about eternity, we're talking about big things. And as I shared last week, is that these days I feel that people are asking me personally, people are asking me more questions about heaven than I ever got before. I'm getting questions like, what is the criteria to enter into heaven? And how do I know if I'm going to be there? And how do I know if my uncle's going to be there? And sometimes we think to ourselves, how can I ensure that I don't lose my spot? Is there like a reservation system? Can I call ahead? Like how long till it expires? Can I renew it? Is it auto-subscribed? Like how, we want to know all these questions about the kingdom. So what we're doing in this series is we're going to ask Jesus, Jesus, what did you teach about the kingdom? Now, unfortunately, as we saw last week, is that Jesus rarely spoke directly about the kingdom of God. He rarely spoke directly and said, here's a blueprint for what heaven's going to look like. Here's directions. He rarely spoke directly about it. He sometimes did, but the majority of the time, he didn't speak directly. He used parables. Matthew chapter 13 says it this way. Okay? This thing might not be working. Sorry. A little help. A little help in the back. Sorry. Click, click, click. Click, please. Thank you. Matthew chapter 13, verse 34 and 35 says, this thing's not working, sorry. Just hit the click button. Oh, anyway, it says that Jesus spoke to them. One more. There we go. No, click. Just hit the click. Yeah. Anyway, it talks about how Jesus did not speak to them without a parable. He did not speak to them. All right? And what a parable is, while we work on getting the clicking going, okay, we'll get it there hopefully. What a, oops. Going the wrong direction. Okay. What a parable is, for those who weren't here last week, is a parable is an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. So a parable is not a fairy tale. A parable is not like in a galaxy far, far, far away. What a parable is, there we go, we got it up on the screen, sort of. It says, all these things Jesus spoke to the multitude in parables, and without a parable he did not speak to them, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet, saying... I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter things kept secret from the foundation of the world. Jesus spoke about the kingdom, but he rarely spoke in direct teaching. Why? Because as we talked about last week, heaven is bigger than words can contain. Heaven is eternal. Heaven is infinite. So I can't tell you, you know, take 66 West, get off on this exit, and you know, it's a piece of land. It's right next to this this orange uh, guy selling oranges by the side of the street. It is like that. So what Jesus said is, let me tell you a story, because stories are worth a thousand words. He said, let me tell you a story. Once upon a time, there was a man who had a vineyard. And this is how he dealt with his servants. And the kingdom of heaven is like that. He said, once upon a time, there was a man who had a son, and he wanted to throw a banquet for this son. And he invited some people. The kingdom of heaven is like that. The kingdom of heaven is like a man, something that you can all relate to. A man who had some seeds, and he went out to his field, and he went out to plant those seeds. That's how Jesus talked about the kingdom. They're real stories. They're not, again, fairy tales. They're not about talking unicorns or anything, a galaxy far, far, far away. And the reason why this is important, that they are real stories, they may not have really taken place. Okay, they're all like stories that, that can't, like it wasn't a real person that took place. But the reason why it's important that they're real stories is because what we saw last week in Luke chapter 17, verse 20, this verse is our theme for this series. Jesus said, the kingdom of God does not come with observation. Nor will they say, see here or see there, for indeed, the kingdom of God is, say it with, with me, the kingdom of God is within you. within you. And I told you last week that within you can better be translated in your midst. Meaning, the kingdom of God is not like one day. The kingdom of God is not like maybe we'll get to see it. The kingdom of God, like the people asked him, when is the kingdom coming? And Jesus is like, when? Don't say when. He said, look around, because it's in your midst. And in your midst, what it, mean, what, it, what, it, what it means is not necessarily within you the way we sometimes think of it. It is, but what he's saying literally here is imagine Jesus in a circle of people all around him. People all around him, front side, back side, everywhere. And they said, when is the kingdom? He said, when? Look in your midst, dummy. 
Look around you. It's right there, meaning himself. He is the kingdom because he is the king. So the same thing is true for us. The kingdom of God is not something that we have to wait for. The kingdom of God, we will wait to get the fulfillment of it, the fullness. But the kingdom of God is something that we can taste here and now. We should start to experience from here and now because it's about having the king in our midst. And if we're members of the church and the body of Christ, king in our midst, this is something that should be common to us to think about. So what we're doing in this series, like I said, what can we learn? Each week we're going to see a different parable and see just one lesson. This is not a verse-by-verse study of the parables. This is just one question we're going to ask every week, which is, where is the kingdom? Where is the kingdom? Last week, we started with the parable, what I would say is probably the most famous parable in all that Jesus gave, of all the scriptures, which is the Good Samaritan. And we saw last week, if you remember, that this kingdom of God, where is the kingdom of God? The kingdom of God is where you least expect it. The kingdom of God last week was not in where you expect it. You expected it in the priest, you expected it in the Levite, or you expected it in an Israelite, a Jew. A, a priest, a Levite, or a Jew, that's where you expected. And then we saw last week, curveball out of left field. The kingdom of God came in a Samaritan. The opposite of what you were expecting, the opposite of what you wanted. Everything said, we don't want that Samaritan. But that's the kingdom of God. We saw for us, the kingdom of God often is the same way. The kingdom of God, we want it in big miracles. We want it in answers to prayer. We want it in signs in the heavens. And sometimes, truthfully, the kingdom of God is not in answers. It's in questions. It's not in solutions. Sometimes it's in problems. The kingdom of God sometimes is in the confusion and in the I don't know. <clears throat> and that's why we said last week, our prayer for the week was, Lord, open my eyes. Lord, open my eyes. Lord, open my eyes that I may see your kingdom coming daily on a daily basis to me. Sometimes in problems, sometimes in suffering, sometimes in pain, sometimes in doubts, sometimes in things that I don't want. And I was very encouraged that I had several conversations with people over the past seven days where people told me that they experienced the kingdom of God coming in a way that they hadn't expected, but because they were praying and they were thinking this way, they found God coming in certain ways that they might not have been looking for otherwise. So that was last week, kingdom of God and the unexpected. This week, if last week was the most famous parable, the Good Samaritan, I would say this week's parable is probably a close second. This week's parable that we're going to look at is known by people, again, people who never read the Bible know this story. And in fact, if you go, actually, most religions, most religions, especially ancient ones, have a version of this parable in their history, but none of them, it ends the way Jesus tells the story. And that parable is the parable of the prodigal son. The parable of the prodigal son, you, you see what is up there on the screen in Latin, is evangelium in evangelio. You may hear that said. You may see that written about. That's what scholars call this. And that means the gospel within the gospel. Because you can take all of Christianity and you could summarize it, put it in a nutshell, and this story would give you all the essential facts about what Christianity is. Because the story is, you all have heard the story before. We'll read it again, but just at a high level. It's about a man with the two sons, and then the son does the worst thing, and then the father forgives him. So if you look at Christianity in a nutshell, summarize it. It's sinfulness of man, foolishness of man, stupidity of man, and goodness of God. Grace of God, mercy of God. And that's why, like I said, scholars call it the gospel within the gospel. And you could get so much theology and lessons from it, but that's not our goal. Our goal is to answer one, one question. What's the question we're going to answer? It is, where is the kingdom? We're going to read the parable right now. That's the only thing we care about. We're going to gloss over a lot of other stuff. You can study it another time. Our question is, where is the kingdom of God? Where is the kingdom of God? The parable of the prodigal son comes to us in Luke chapter 15. Luke 15 is a famous chapter where Jesus actually told three parables back to back to back, and that's the lost sheep, the lost coin, and then the story of the prodigal son. But all three are in response to a particular statement, or better, a complaint, or even more accurate, an accusation made against him by the Pharisees. So let's get that context before we get into the story. Luke 15 begins in verse 1. It says, Then all the tax collectors and the sinners drew near to him to hear him. And the Pharisees and scribes complained, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. So he spoke this parable to them, saying, 
story starts off, you have to know this because the reason Jesus gave the story of the prodigal son is in response to this. It wasn't just like out of the blue, like, hey, I have a teaching for today. It's people came, the Pharisees and the scribes, they were complaining, and then Jesus responded to their complaint with this parable. First, let's try to understand the context. Who are the Pharisees? We read about the Pharisees a lot, and usually it's in a negative light. The Pharisees are kind of, I call them the hall monitors of the New Testament. They're kind of the guys who stood there with a little pen and pad, guilty, did something on the Sabbath, don't touch that, who said that? Like, they're just there, and they're just trying to get people in trouble. And ultimately, if you want to know how the story ends, the Pharisees are the reason that Jesus was killed. They didn't actually, with their hands, kill him, but they're the reason that Jesus was killed because they were jealous and they didn't like his ministry, so they're the ones who killed Jesus in the end. So because of that, we think the Pharisees, these are the bad guys. But let's try to understand who the Pharisees are. They didn't start off as bad guys. They actually started off as good guys. They actually, they're reformers. If you go back and study in the histories of where the Pharisees came from, Pharisees were a political party. There was two parties in, in ancient Israel. The Pharisees was one. Who knows what the other party was? The Sadducees. Okay, very good. And you could think of them like the liberals and the conservatives. I won't say who's what, okay, but anyway, they're both bad, okay? They're both bad here. But they had a two-party system. And together, the Sadducees and the Pharisees made up the Sanhedrin, which was the ruling body. It was 70 people plus the high priest. Think of it, it's actually very similar to what we have, where you have the Democrats and the Republicans, and they form the Congress, and they have like the head of the Congress or the head of the, what's it called, the, the Speaker of the House, okay, whatever it may be, as like the tiebreaker. They had the high priest who was like the tiebreaker guy, but then you had the Sanhedrin, the Pharisees, and the Sadducees. The Sadducees, we'll start with the Pharisees. The Pharisees, they were reformers. They actually came into power, came into being as a way to bring Israel back to their roots. The Sadducees, okay, when you think of Pharisees and Sadducees, Pharisees think synagogue, Sadducees think temple. Pharisees think synagogue, Sadducees temple. The Sadducees controlled the temple. They were the priesthood. They were in charge of all the sacrifices. And they were the ones who were in power for the longest time. And basically, because there have been so many problems, so many different things, the Sadducees were just like, look, you know what? Just offer sacrifices. Don't worry about anything else. So they had a very kind of watered-down version of Judaism. And they were just mainly focused on offering sacrifices, offering sacrifices, because you needed a priest to offer sacrifice, so it kept them in power. Then along comes the Pharisees, and the Pharisees, like I said, they were the reformers. They were the ones who said, but there's more than the sacrifices. God cares about holy life and living according to the Torah. And that's why they started preaching that we need to go back to our roots. We need to go back to the law of Moses. The temple was controlled by the Sadducees, so the Pharisees started synagogues. And the synagogues, you did not offer sacrifices. Sacrifices only in the temple at the altar. Synagogues is more about teaching the word of God. And it was about going back to the Torah and reading the law and reforming Judaism to go back to the way it used to be. That's what I'm saying. The Pharisees started off as a good thing. But then the problem came when they went too far down that track. And the most notable difference between the Sadducees and the Pharisees, okay, in, 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 in Judaism, they had something called the written law, the Torah, that's the scripture. They also had something called oral law. And this is where the Pharisees got themselves in trouble. So what happened is, for example, God said, keep holy the Sabbath day. That's written law. That was written by Moses. That's written down. The Pharisees came up with an oral law on top of the written law. So the oral law said, in order to keep the written law, the holy Sabbath day, you're only allowed to walk X amount of cubits. 2,000 cubits, that's it. You walk 2,001 cubits, then you didn't keep holy the Sabbath day. So they took the law of God, and they tried to build a fence around it. So law of God, 10 laws, they built 613 laws around the law of God. And that's obviously why we call them legalistic. Okay, another one, uh, honor your father and mother, command of God, written, written, written law, that's the Torah. Pharisees came and said, what that means is you have to give your dad X amount of your income if it's this, and if you sell this, you have to give your mom this, and if you gave 1% less, then you didn't honor your father and mother. You see how this works? They were legalistic. They missed the forest from the trees, or the trees from the forest, however that expression goes. 
They felt they were the defenders of the faith, the protectors of the faith. They had to make sure that nobody changed the faith, okay, because they had to keep it pure. They were before social media, but man, they would have loved Facebook, okay, because this would have been a prime platform for them because all they did was say, that's wrong, and that's wrong, and that's wrong, and they had the moral high ground in so many different areas. So they started off good, but they got lost because they became too focused on what? On the rules. Hold that thought. They got too focused on the what? On the rules. Here's a perfect example. In this passage right here, it said, the tax collectors and sinners came to Jesus, and they should have been happy. They weren't happy because they didn't care about people coming to Jesus. They cared only about their rules and people following their rules. So this happens right here, and Jesus could have easily told them, hey, you guys, you're wrong to complain about the sinners coming to me. I came for the sinners. He could have said, you guys are wrong. He could have said, you guys are mistaken, but he didn't. He said, let me tell you a story. And like I said, he told them three stories. One was about a shepherd who had 100 sheep and lost one. We're not going to read that. One was about a, man, a woman who had 10 coins and lost one. Not going to read that. And then another one about a man who had two sons and lost one of them. We're going to read that. Starting in verse 11. And I want you, I know you know how the story goes, but I want you to pretend like you're hearing this for the first time. You're standing in Israel, ancient Israel. You're hearing this from Jesus' mouth. A certain man had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falls to me. So he divided to them his livelihood. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together, journeyed to a far country, and there wasted his possessions with prodigal living. Story starts off, man with two sons, younger son says, give me my inheritance, and he goes off and he wastes it all. Jewish society, ancient Jewish society, had very strict rules about many areas of life, but the number one area that they were concerned with was inheritance. It was a big deal for them because they were God's chosen people, and it was all about what they're going to leave on. And the next gen and So for them, inheritance was a huge, huge, huge deal, and especially because back then it's not like today. Like today, I can say, okay, what, I'm going to leave my kids, liquidate these assets, invest it over here, sell whatever. That's not the way it was back then. Back then, you didn't, couldn't liquidate your assets. You had land. And you sold the land and you gave the money to whoever it may be or you gave up the land itself. So you couldn't, like it's not something you could get back at another point in time. You can't reinvest it later. So this was a big deal for them. And usually, the inheritance that you would leave your son, where did it come from? It came from your father leaving it to you and probably his father leaving it to him and probably his father leaving it to him like it's something that's been in the family. Like this is the family farm. This is our land. The land, okay? And you have to fight for the land and you have to keep the land and maybe you expand the land. But it's something that took a lifetime to acquire and if we're honest, it probably took several lifetimes to acquire even before you. It was the role of the father in the patriarchal society. His role was to divide the inheritance. That was his primary role, to make sure that everyone got exactly what belonged to them. And if he didn't, it would get bloody. You don't believe me? Go read the book of Genesis and, and, and see exactly what would happen when sons and siblings would fight over inheritance. And of all the rules of inheritance, there was one which was just so obvious it didn't need to be stated. What's the most important rule when it comes to inheritance? The father has to be dead. Thank you very much. Okay? That's the number one rule. Like, there's, there's all these rules, technicalities, but it's all after the father dies. There's only one exception of when an inheritance be, could be given before the father was dead. Anyone want to guess? It was when the father was ill and needed to be taken care of and couldn't take care of himself. In that situation, it was allowable to divide the inheritance, but it was clear, I'm giving you the inheritance to do what with it? to take care of me. So I give you all that I have because you can't take care of me by yourself, so I give it to you, but it's only to take care of me. Again, the central idea is that the father's alive, the money is his, it's not the child's. It wasn't his right. So here we go. We got a story that begins with a son, probably about 17 years old in his teenage years. We know that because if he, they used to marry them off around 18, 19, 20 years old. 
Okay, some would say the good old days, but that's not for us to decide. <laughs> a son about 17 years old comes and says, Dad, I'm sick and tired of waiting for you to die. I've been waiting for you to die. You won't die. Like I've been telling my friends, any day now he's going to die, and I just can't take it anymore. So from now on, you're dead to me. Give me my money. And not just he says this, which is so rude and so horrible, and we can talk about that forever. That's not our subject. But within one verse, like this is the part that's painful. Within one verse, all of that inheritance is gone. All of the inheritance is gone within one verse. Imagine how the dad feels. How would you feel if you're the father? I'm a father. I have two kids. I have an inheritance. I got a 401k. Okay? Yeah, priest, in case you're wondering, priest, we retire. I ain't doing this for the rest of my life, okay? I'm retired like you're going to retire, okay? So there come a point in time where I'm going to retire, and I have money saved up, and I, because I was preparing this, I got two kids, and I went to my 401k to check what it is, okay, and all my different stuff, and I just imagine thinking to myself, if half of that disappeared by Monday, I would die. <laughs> I would just die, just right there, because it's not about the money. It's not that I care about the money. I don't care about the money. Like, but it's just, I spent my whole life to acquire that. And it's not much. I'm not saying I'm sitting on millions of dollars. Okay, it's a pre salary. But what I'm saying is, I worked hard for however many years. Okay, I'm 46 years old. I've been working hard for how many years? My wife works hard. We work really hard. We make sacrifices to save up so that I can give it to my kids. And in 15 minutes, he flushed half of it down the toilet. Like, and not even like he used it. Not even like he helped some, not like he built a church or helped the homeless, like something. My whole life, and 50% of it, you just <laughs> flushed it down the toilet like that. How would you feel? You'd be furious. You'd be irate. And I think the hearers of this parable would be as well, and rightly so. That's why the next verse puts a little bit of a smile on their face. Verse 14. But when he had spent all, there arose a severe famine in that land, and he began to be in want. Good. Then he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into the fields to feed swine. Better. Feed the swine. Good. And he would have gladly filled his stomach with the paws that the swine ate, and no one gave him anything. To which they all stood up and said, yes, that's what we want. That's exactly what we teach. Wrath of God. Because he broke the rules, he deserves to be punished. And they were happy. They said, this is a great parable right now. There was a rule. He broke the rule. God is angry at him. You get what you deserve. And they would have loved it if the parable ended right there. Verse 17, it continues. But when he came to himself, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have bread enough and to spare, and I perish with hunger? I will arise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and before you, and I'm no longer worthy to be called your son Make me like one of your hired servants. And they're like, okay, son coming back. Okay, but you know what? Let the little punk come back. Let him come back on his hands and knees. And then the dad's going to see him. He's going to spit in his face. And he's going to kick him in the behind. Okay, he's going to get what he deserves. I'm sure the dad is going to stick it to this guy because of what he just did. He's going to teach him a lesson. Verse 20. And he arose and came to his father. But when he was still a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight, and I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring out the best robe and put it on him, and put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet, and bring the fatted calf here and kill it, and let us eat and be merry. Again, let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead and is alive again, was lost and is found, and they began to be merry. Now, it is not our subject today. Okay, the father's reaction to the son, an incredible response, not our subject. I actually spoke about this a few weeks ago. That's a different sermon for a different time. We're sticking here with the kingdom of God and where is the kingdom of God. Here what we see, the son broke a law. Everybody agree? The son broke a law. And the dad lets him off the hook. The dad doesn't punish him. The dad doesn't hold him according to what the law says he should. Which by then, by that definition, who else broke a law? The dad broke a law. The son broke a law, and the dad was required to treat him in a certain way, and the dad didn't. So the dad broke a law. What law did the dad break? Well, there's a law that says in the book of Deuteronomy, I believe, 
that the rebellious son shall be stoned. Okay? It is one of the best verses in the Bible. Every parent should hang it over the fireplace. Okay? <laughs> we read it together every night before dinner. Okay? The rebellious son should be stoned. He did not stone his son. In addition, his son, he hugged his son when he came back. That's breaking the law. Why? His son was not clean. His son had been living with who? First with Gentiles and then with swine. So the son is dirty and the father made himself dirty. And then secondly, not just by hugging him, by eating with him. He broke all the rules. In addition, the father runs out to meet the son. Now, it wasn't against the law to, for a father to run, but it for sure was against the, the, the common practice at the time. It was disgraceful. It's like, what are you doing, man? Like, what, what, what's going on? You broke all these laws, and in addition, you fed him a meal? You got him sandals? Got him a robe? You spent more money on him? Are you crazy? It said, bring out the best robe. Where would the best robe from the household come from? The father. Father had the best robe. So you gave him your inheritance. Now you give him your robe. You give him your meal. Like you, by all standards, by all standards of the time, this dad broke all the law. So Pharisees are thinking, where's the law? Where's the rules? And the answer comes in the next son, verse 25. Now his older son was in the field. And as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said to him, Your brother has come, and because he has received him safe and sound, your father has killed the fatted calf. But he was angry and would not go in. Therefore his father came out and pleaded with him. The older son is angry. Why? Okay, well, he's angry because he's annoyed at his younger brother for being a brat. Okay, but we don't care about that. The inheritance, he just lost. Half of the inheritance got lost, so his half just got cut in half. Because now that this guy's back, he's going to get now half. But he already spent, like you had 100, he spent 50. Now we're going to divide the 50? So I just went from 50 to 25. And in addition, if something happens to dad, okay, and he gets sick because of this foolish boy, then even that's going to get lost. So this son has a right to be angry. And he says so. And that's why he says he was angry he would not go in. So the father pleaded with him. And the father said, please, son, it's okay. The older son responds to him. Verse 29. He says, so he answered and said to his father, lo, these many years I have been serving you. I never transgressed your commandment at any time. And yet you never gave me a young goat that I might make merry with my friends. But as soon as the son of yours came, who has devoured your livelihood with harlots, you killed the fatted calf for him. Ouch. He's saying not just the son is bad, but again, who's bad? You are bad, Dad. You don't know what you're doing. You, you let him step all over you. Father responds, verse 31. And he said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that I have is yours. It was right that we should make merry and be glad, for your brother was dead and is alive again, was lost and is found. That's the parable. You heard it before. Again, we could go into many different directions with this parable. It's the gospel within the gospel. But I'm asking one question. Where's the kingdom of God? Where's the kingdom of God? Where's the kingdom of God in the story? Last week, the kingdom of God, like I said, was in the surprise. Because they expected it here, and it was actually over here. Today, the kingdom of God is also in a surprise. And it's a surprise specifically to the hearers, which were the Pharisees and the people who focused on the rules. And that is this. You won't find the kingdom... In the law, but rather in love. That was Jesus' message to the Pharisees. That's why he told this story. You won't find the kingdom in the law. But you find it rather in love. In other words, it seems that the kingdom of God is not as concerned with conventional thinking as we are. We like things, okay, to be organized and rules and structure. And by the rules and structure of the time, Everything the dad did was bad. He was a bad father. If you put on the list of do not be like in, in, in parenting class, it would be like this guy because he did everything wrong. He let two kids walk all over him. Two kids he let walk all over him with no consequence to either. He let two kids break the law and didn't do anything to either one of them. Notice I'm saying two kids. Usually we think of one kid who broke the law. The younger son broke the law, but the older son broke the law as well. How did the older son break the law? The younger one is easy. Okay, we talk about that's easy. How did the older son break the law? 
What was his sin? Resentment. Okay, so most of us would say his sin was resentment, envy, jealousy. But you know what? I'm not saying it's not a sin, but it's not a sin to them. Because Judaism didn't care about these inside sins. Anger, resentment, bitterness, like these fluffy things. Get those out of here. They cared only about rules. They cared only about rules. So I'm saying, aside from those inside sins, he had an outside sin. He broke the law. What law did he break? Very good. The fourth commandment says what? Honor your father and mother. And he did not honor his father here. He flat out disobeyed with him. Because it said that the dad came out and pleaded with him. And he would not go in. So he not only was rude in his tone, he not only was disrespectful in the way he berated him, but he flat out disobeyed him. Now the reason why, you and I, we don't think of that as a sin. Like what he did wasn't that big a deal. The reason why, I'm just being honest right here, not trying to be funny, but I'm just being honest, is because the way our, way our kids talk to us today. And we look at what he said, and we're like, what's the big deal? My kids say that every morning before school. Okay, But back then, that shows how low we've gotten. Back then, this is not how you talk to your father. I don't even want to say back then, like, could you have talked to your dad this way? Like, I'll get this verse right here. Verse 28, back on the screen. Is that he was angry and would not go in. Therefore, his father came out and pleaded with him. This wouldn't happen when I was growing up. But this happened when you grew up. Like, my dad would plead with me and beg me. No, the belt would come off, okay? <laughs> and I'd be inside. That's how it worked back in the day. And even more so back in the first century. But because us and we, but for this, this was a big deal is what I'm saying. He disobeyed. He was disrespectful. He broke the law. The older son was just as guilty in this story as the younger son. They both broke the law. They both were guilty. The only difference in the story is the behavior. Bo bo both of them broke the law. Both of them were shown mercy. The only difference was in their response to the mercy and forgiveness of the father. But the kingdom of God, Jesus' message to them, the kingdom of God isn't in the law. The kingdom of God is in love. And nothing the younger son could do could negate it. And nothing the older son could do could negate it either because the kingdom of God is in love and no sin can negate that. The hearers of this story didn't like this. This is not an easy pill for them to swallow. Why? Because as I said earlier, they built their entire political platform their entire life was exactly the opposite of this. It was that there's a system, and if you do good, you get rewarded. If you do bad, you get punished. And if we're honest, that's a system we like as well. That's why we don't struggle with. Nobody, str nobody struggles with, why does bad stuff happen to bad people? Nobody has ever asked that question. Why does bad stuff happen to bad people? We want bad stuff for bad people. We want good for good. We want bad for bad. We want if you follow the law, you get rewarded. If you break the law, you get punished. And that sounds very nice, but that's not Jesus. That's not the kingdom of God. That can be your kingdom. That can be how you write the rules. That can be man-made religion. That's fine. But Jesus came very clear. The kingdom of God is not in law, in law. The kingdom of God is in love. And he came to turn the world upside down by saying that. And as the hearers were listening to this story, for sure, as Jesus told the story of a father with two sons, and the younger was so disobedient, yet somehow he was forgiven. They thought of another story from their history. There was a parallel that they were drawn to as they heard the story of a father with two sons, and the younger was bad, but the younger was still chosen by the father to be blessed. Who's that? Jacob and Esau. And that story, it seems like the father did the wrong thing again there. Because Jacob was sneaky, and Jacob was bad, and Jacob was disobedient. Esau stood by his father's side. But somehow in that, again, God doesn't operate based on the law. God chose the younger. God chose that guy to be blessed because God doesn't make decisions. Here's the important part. God is telling the Pharisees, I don't make decisions the way you make decisions. I don't make decisions based on just the rules. I don't make decisions based on just the law. I make them based on love. Hosea chapter 6, verse 6, says it this way. It says, For I desire mercy, not sacrifice, and the knowledge of God more than burnt offerings. I desire mercy, not sacrifice, and the knowledge of God more than burnt offerings. That word, knowledge of God, 
I say knowledge of God. What comes to your mind? Like, what does knowledge of God mean? Does that mean a book knowledge? Does that mean like a studying? Does that mean like an intellectual knowledge? Well, the word know, especially in the Old Testament, okay, the first time we hear it used was that Adam knew his wife. And obviously when it said that Adam knew her, it wasn't talking about like, yeah, I knew what shoe size she was, okay? It meant that he knew her. It meant something much more. Knowledge comes from intimacy. The kingdom of God, that's why I say it this way, the kingdom of God is found in love. Great. Love is practiced through intimacy. When God is saying that I desire knowledge of God more than burnt offerings, what he's saying is I want intimacy more than I want rule following with my children. Let's go back to the story of the prodigal. Let's go back to the story of the man with the two sons. Both of the sons almost missed the kingdom of God. And the reason why is actually the same for both of them. Is because both of them lacked intimacy with their father. They had they lived in the father's house. They had probably like a business relationship with the father, but they never had that intimacy with their father. And I'll prove it to you. When the father, I'm sorry, when the son came back, the younger son, when he came back, what is the thing, first thing the father said we're going to do? He said, kill the fatted calf and let's feed him. He said the boy's problem was that he's hungry. He's empty. He's lacking. Feed him, feed him, feed him, feed him. Like all of a sudden, the dad becomes all of our moms, okay, when we would come home from school. Like, feed him, feed him, feed him, feed him, feed him. Feed him. All right? And did you know that God wants to feed us like a mom, like the way our moms wanted to feed us? Like we always think of God as our father. God is our father, obviously. But God is not just, like there's not one word that can describe all of God. God is too big. So yes, God is father. But did you know God also has qualities of mother as well? Okay, Isaiah chapter 66, verse 13. As one whom his mother comforts, so I will comfort you and you shall be comforted in Jerusalem. God is not just father. God is father, God is mother, God is friend, God is Lord, God is creator. Like, there's no one word that can fit all of God. But here specifically what I'm talking about is God is reminding us that the goal isn't just that you live in my house and follow my rules and make your bed and clean your room. The goal is that I feed you and feed you and nourish you and sit at the table. Reminds me of another verse. Revelation chapter 3 verse 20 says it this way. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. First century Judaism, dining, eating together was a very intimate thing. That's why you couldn't eat with those people. And there was, there, it was more than just, like there was a fellowship that was involved in sharing a meal. That's why all the religious celebrations were centered around the table of the Lord and a meal together. So what Jesus is saying right here, He's saying, my desire, again, not just that you're my servant, not just that you live in the house and do the chores, but sit at the table, have a seat. I want to feed you. I want to nourish you. I want to comfort you. I want to give you. I want to be your father, but I also want to be your mother. I want to be your Lord, but I also want to be your friend. And we need to remember that, that both sons almost lost the kingdom because they were empty and they weren't into, had to have the intimacy with the Father. And for us, make sure you read your Bible. Make sure you say your prayer. Make sure you go to church. All those things are important. But not just for the sake of. All those, the go- those are a means to an end. And the end is the feeding. So the goal is read your Bible. Why? So that Jesus can feed you. Don't get up from the table till he's fed you. Stand and say your prayers. Why? So he can feed you. Go to church. Why? So he can give you a big meal. But if we just go through the motions and we're doing all the stuff, but we're not eating, like we're cleaning the table, we're serving the table, we're vacuuming the table, we're washing the table, we're setting up the table, we're doing everything with the table. But if we're not eating of the table, then we're in danger of being like these guys. Why? Because here's the message in a nutshell. I want you to repeat after me. Okay, we're going to read this on the screen, but I want you to repeat it after me. Arlington, I want to hear you saying it as well. God is the perfect parent. Again, I didn't hear Arlington. All together, God is the perfect parent who loves the older just as much as the younger. Who loves the older just as much as the younger. 
and desires intimacy with each. That's the message of the prodigal son. Each son sinned. Each son sinned. Each of them broke the law. And the father broke the law in response to each one of their breaking the law. And he said, look, I don't care. I don't want to say I don't care about the law, but that's not how I make my decisions. The kingdom of God is not in the law. Both sons grew up in the same house. Both sons grew up with the same father. Both sons went through the same motions. And at a point in time, each one of them found themselves hungry because they didn't connect with him in a way of intimacy. And as members of God's house today, my fear is that we are in the same danger because we are in the house of God. And we are going through all the motions. And the motions are good. I'm not against the motions. The motions are good. The rules are good. The law is good. All of it is good as long as we realize that the kingdom, the law is just a means to get us to love. The law is just a means to get us where God wants us to be. Said another way, the goal isn't to be in the house of the Father. The goal isn't to be in the house of the Father. The goal is to be inside the Father of the house. That's where these guys, that's where especially the older son missed it. He said, all these years I've been in the house, I've been in the house, I've been in the house. Yeah, you've been in the house of the Father, but you weren't in the Father of the house. And I don't ever want that to be us here in the church. So, the verse that I want to leave you with is what Jesus said when these Pharisees heard this. Jesus said this whole parable just for the sake of the Pharisees because they said, law, 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 law. And Jesus wanted to tell them that, look, whether you keep the law or break the law, whether it's the Jew or the Gentile, whether it's the obedient or the disobedient, all are my sons. And all of them are my children and nothing, no sin, no nothing can negate love. If love is like this and love is like the ocean, there's no amount of dirt that you can put in the ocean to pollute the ocean. There's no, nothing that you can do to go against the love of God. You can try, you can throw rocks at it, you can do whatever it may be, you can punch it, you can kick it, but love of God will always stand firm. And what he says to everyone, like I said, Jew and Gentile, older and younger, he says this, son, you are always with me and all that I have is yours. Son, you are always with me and all that I have is yours. Let us never forget that the Father desires all to be in his house because the Father is love. Even when we break the law, there's always forgiveness. There's always mercy. Yes, there's repentance. We're not talking, that's not our subject for today. So I'm not saying it's just cheap and I'm not saying it's easy. There is repentance, but there's always a way back and nothing, this is an important part and I'm done. Nothing can make the Father give away your inheritance. Nothing you do can make the Father give away your inheritance your name is on it. It's, or it has your name written on it, and that will never change no matter what anyone else says about it. Let's stand up for a prayer. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord. Thank you for your incredible, infinite love for all of us. Thank you, Lord, that you don't make decisions based on just the law because if you did, Lord, none of us could stand here in front of you. Thank you that you give us your love and you give us this great example of the, of the Father in this story to remind us that all of us are, 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 are your children and our inheritance is there. I pray, Lord, that you would help us to see your kingdom this week in so many different ways, but especially help us to look for it not in the law, but in love and in intimacy with you. We pray these things in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, with the prayers and intercessions of all your saints. Lord, hear us as we pray thankfully. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. In Christ Jesus our Lord, for thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever forever.